The question is, how many times did Jesus return after the crucifixion? So, which is actually kind of a good question, right? Because on the one hand, we hear about his rising from the dead, and then we hear about his, his ascension, and then we also hear other things like St. Paul on the road to Damascus and Jesus talking at him, right? <laughs> talking at him. Paul, oh, Saul, Saul. <laughs> Why are you persecuting me? So, all right, so it depends on what we mean by return, right? So on the one hand, Jesus died once. He was resurrected once, right? Um, and then he hung out sporadically with his, uh, with his disciples over the course of another um, period of time. And then... And then he went, yeah, he ascended to the Father. So, um, so that's the only time that happened, right? But of course, just as God the Father is present to us, right? Jesus is as well. In fact, some of the, um, many of the, uh, of the early church fathers uh, read the Old Testament, and as they went through the Old Testament, any time uh, they read um, the, the angel of the Lord, right? Or any time the Lord appears to someone, that sort of thing. Um, they said, aha, it's the second person of the Trinity, <laughs> right? It's Jesus, except it's not Jesus yet. He hasn't been incarnate, but it's God the Son. He's the one who... Is, you know, by his nature, is manifest to people, right? So that that must be him in the burning bush. That must be him wrestling with Jacob, right? That it must be him doing all those things that we hear about God doing in the Old Testament where he's actually, you know, manifest to people, right? Um, so our, our reading, actually, there's another kind of, kind of thread in the Old Testament with people who are um, w- with appearances like the one we had in our Old Testament lesson this morning, right? Um, where the three strangers come to Abraham. And it's, it's one of those funny stories where you feel like you're missing something. Like there's something in there that we're not told, right? Because the three, the three people show up and Abraham runs out to meet them and bows in front of them and said, and calls them Lord. Singular. Huh. So, the so, well, that's the thought of the church fathers is that this represents the Trinity. Right? Of course, anyone who is Jewish reading this would not read it that way. Right? Oh, yeah. um, but to the early Christian fathers, they went... <laughs> See there, that proves it then, don't it? Right? <laughs> you know, which to our minds is kind of like, well, I'm not sure if it proves anything, but it's interesting, right? So, um, so it, the, uh, the famous um, icon of the Trinity by Rublev, right? Um, you've all seen it, right? It's the, the three uh, angelic people around the, around the table with the piece of bread on it, the loaf of bread on it. That's from that scene, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's an icon of the Trinity. So, anyway, um, so uh, as far as Jesus is concerned, um, the uh, he he speaks to various people um, at various times. On the other hand. Um, well, okay, so I need to step back for a second here. Even after his resurrection and before the ascension, he appears to various people at various times, right? So there's the road to Emmaus when he appears, right, to Cleopas and his companion, right? And they don't recognize him until he explains everything, and they still don't recognize him, and then he breaks the bread when they invite him to eat with them, and then they re- recognize him, and then he disappears, right? Right? The story of my life. You recognize Jesus, then he disappears. But <laughs> so, um, 
there's that, and then he appears to everybody at, uh, at, at the Sea of Galilee after they go fishing, right? And he, uh, and he tells them to throw their nets on the other side again, and they, they say, they have a big haul, and, and Peter goes, aha, I know who that is, and jumps out and, run, and swims. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, he, he appears various times at various places. Um, but there is one death, one resurrection, one ascension. Um, and that's that. Did, have I answered the question? Yes, thank you. Cool. Do you, do you want me to go print out that Trinity icon of the hospitality of Abraham? Not right now. Not right now. I think everybody's kind of seen yeah. that. You'd yeah, recognize it if yeah, you, saw you saw it. it. Okay. But uh, if anybody's okay. interested, we can go look for it afterward. Yeah, we can. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, I think I answered that question. So we'll, we shall move on. Sometimes we can beat these things to death. But not so <laughs> I'm, try, I'm sort of trying to pull from the bottom of the pile here. All right. All right, so, so right, from one end of the spectrum to the other. So um, this question is, how and why was St. Michael the archangel chosen as our patron, and what does that mean? So, um, also a great question. I was not here, but Malcolm was, so maybe he can tell us. Kevin was. Kevin was. Aha! She's behind me, so I don't. So Kevin was. So, um, so maybe you can fill in the gaps. But let me just sort of put this all in perspective. Um, the. Uh, there is a long-standing tradition right, of individual parishes and other organizations, for that matter, um, uh, having a patron saint, right? Someone who receives special devotion, someone who we hope will intercede for us, right? That sort of thing. Um, now, remember... Last week we were talking about how we don't we don't entirely understand the mechanics of what happens after we die, but there are some people that we recognize as having truly been saints, right? The church has always said, you know, okay, this guy, this gal, they were heroes of the faith, and you know, um, we believe in the communion of saints. We believe that we can pray for them. They can pray for us. Some, in some sense, don't know exactly how that works, um, but uh, but we're going to have one, right? We're, so what happens, though, is that some church, some parishes, and other organizations will have um, will have designations that do not actually specify a patron. So it's easy if you've got St. Michael's Church, right, or St. Thomas Church, right? Um, what if you have um, uh, All Saints Church or... Um, or Holy Trinity, right, or Grace Church, or the Church of the Holy Nativity, right? Well, since you don't have a, uh, a patronal feast, right, a, a, a patron of name is the way to say that, right? Um, so if you don't have that, then you still have a have a... Uh, a feast day, right? The nativity, actually, our feast day is Christmas, right? That's the nativity. Um, but we also are free to kind of choose a patron, right, along the way. You had something Yes, to say. I think I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I think it was because St. Michael's was the closest to the day that we became a parish. Mm, yes, that and would that's make why sense. They chose it. That would make I'm pretty sense. Pretty sure that's the jumped into my mind. Right. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. That's helpful. So, um, uh, so also by longstanding tradition, the holy angels, right? I mean, 
if you if you get down to it, the word saint just means holy, right? Um, and so the holy angels, some of whom we know by name, right, have been in that list of possible patrons. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you're close to the 29th of, uh, of September, happy birthday, Lucy, then, um, uh, then you might pick St. Michael, right? Uh, Lucy gives up her birthday every year for the Feast of St. Michael. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, she gets a birthday party every year, right? So it's a, it's a trade-off. So, um, so uh, that's, that's as far as it goes. Were there, were there any follow-up questions to that? I mean, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Yeah. I'm glad it's not rocket science. No, it's not rocket science. Not knowing. Okay. Right. In, exactly. You're saying it is a patron saint. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we take it that he is the one to whom, and this is where I have the problem, uh -huh. of praying to St. Michael to intercede for our parish. Is that off kilter? Yeah. Okay. okay. That's, that's, yeah. Got it. So now we're into the realm of praying to the saints. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so from very, very early on, um, Christians would recognize, um, you know, well, first of all, they recognized the martyrs, mm -hmm. right? And so they would all, um, uh, if there was a local martyr, they would gather at Right, the tomb of the martyr, and remember the martyr's uh, heavenly birthday, right? Which is the date of your death, right? Um, your earthly, your earthly death date is your heavenly birthday, right? That's the idea there. Um, and so, <clears throat> uh, and, and if you if you believe that um, uh, that after death, we are still conscious in some way, right? We remember we talked about this, how, it's, how there are different ideas of how it works after death. Well, certainly one of them is that there is a consciousness, right? I mean, everybody agrees there's a resurrection, right? The question is whether you're conscious between now, or between your death and your resurrection, okay? So, um, so on that idea, Right then, if we know this person was uh, a martyr, right, died for the faith, then we're pretty sure, right, or some would say absolutely sure, of uh, of their state, right. They are with with God somehow, right. So if they're with God somehow, then why not? I mean, it's easy for them. Why not ask them to pray for us, right? I ask you to pray for me. Why not ask that person to pray for me, right? And that whole tradition kind of mushrooms, okay? One of the, one of the results of that is what we've just been talking about, right? The, the whole idea of patron saints and, and all of that. Um, <clears throat> the holy angels would be in that kind of same category, right? They are present to God, or God is present to them, however you want to say that, right? So why not ask them to pray for you, right? Um, <clears throat> we also need to remember that we are a Reformation church, right? So we, we would never say, um, well, we would say that when you get to the point where you're praying to, right, prayer at some point is simply talking to God, right, or letting God talk to you, right? <clears throat> so in one sense, we could say we pray to the saints if all you mean is we're talking to them, right? Um, but if you get to the point where you're praying to the saints in the same way, and or instead of praying to God, right? Now we're now we're wrong, just flat out, right? right? What's that? Right. 
Right out. Exactly. <clears throat> you need to come more often, Lucy. You, you, give, you give me some verve here. Um, so, uh, so, if we, you know, if we say, well, we can pray to St. Michael just the same as we pray to God. Well, yes and no, right? If you just mean we're talking to him, like you can talk to God, then yes. If you mean that we're going to ignore God because St. Michael somehow, or particularly the Virgin Mary is the big, um, she is not at wrong, in the wrong here, but some of, some of the people who speak to her are, right? Um, mm. Uh, if if you say we're going to ignore God because this saint is more relatable or something, right? And we're just going to talk to him or her. Um, now we've lost the whole point of following Jesus. That happened in the Middle Ages, didn't it? I mean, that was really it, one of the arguably, you know, yes. arguably. Yeah. Um, what I always tell people. I, I come I come from a church where saints are asked for intercession all the time and we just think of them as right. community members. So right. what I always tell people is I don't pray to the saints, I pray with the saints. And it's kinda of like going to Stephen Minister, only your Stephen Minister just happens to already be in heaven, you know? <laughs> so right. it's like so it's like that and and then also pray. There's the two different kinds of pray. There's the pray where you're communicating with God. And right. then there's actually a, some, I think, a Greek word for pray or just, or the Elizabethan English, I pray thee, sir. Right. What is the time? Right. <laughs> you know, so pray just means ask Ooh. in one sense of the language. Tell me your name, pray. Yeah. Well, if you get to, you the, just... point, if you get to the point where you're, where you somehow assume that the saints have the same kind of power. Right. Well, Right. Then, then we've got to cross a line, right? Well, you're just wrong. Not always. I mean, the, the whole point of communicating with them is that they pray to God for you. Right. So, so, so this is kind of a weird line, right? Because if I say, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, right? Well, that's fully biblical and creedal, right? I mean, we, we know from the, uh, the Council of Ephesus, the third ecumenical council, that by golly, we can call her the mother of God, right? <laughs> okay. Well, Be- <clears throat> but it's true. Well, she's, not the, she's not the mother of God in the sense of giving birth to God, the Trinity, right? But she is the mother of God in the sense that she bore the second person of the Trinity in her womb for nine months, right? And she gave birth to someone who was God. So, and and that's what that's what um, Saint Cyril of Alexandria recognized at the Council of Ephesus and and argued about, right? Was that you got to be able to say this because otherwise you're saying that that Jesus was sort of two people in one, right? If Mary isn't the mother of God, but she is the mother of Jesus, then now you've got a human part of Jesus and a divine part of Jesus and they're not really one thing. And that's a problem. That's a real problem. That's a real problem. Exactly. So so it's perfectly creedal to to say that, right? And we're just asking her to pray for us. Great. You have no problem. Now, let's shift it a little bit and say, uh, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, please find me a job. Right? Yeah. Um, well, that some of us... Oh, I, I know, I know it has, which is, which is why I use that example. So, <laughs> so here it's kind of dicey, Right? You might mean something untoward. I happen to know Gabrielle and know she doesn't mean something untoward, mm-hmm. right? Here. Because I know her theology, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's something we want to be careful about. On the other hand, you're not necessarily wrong if what you mean is, hey, however, however that cooperation between you and God works up there, wherever you are, however this works... Like, could you could you help me out here, right? <laughs> well, if you start thinking of her as a goddess, that's a problem. Exactly. You know? So that's just it. Exactly. You don't want to 
You don't she want is, to yeah, she's that. not, she, she's not part of the Trinity, like, you know, somebody evidently told Muhammad, right? Um, eh, wrong, right? But if all you mean by that is, you know, hey, y'all, can you help us out down here? Then fine, I don't have a problem with this. Does that, does that help a lot? Help, uh, um, another question, go ahead. Yeah, back up. Back up, oh, oh no, oh no. <laughs> See, I, I told you this is really about, ah, father, he's messing up. So, <laughs> go ahead, what did I say wrong? Oh, no. Wait, wait, <laughs> no, go ahead. Yes. I, I didn't know that. Oh. I didn't either. Um, yeah. Okay. Evidently. Thank you. Um, now, this is hearsay. I, I can't remember where this is or if I actually read it myself in the Quran or somebody told me it was in the Quran. But um, what I remember is that uh, Muhammad's report of Christianity is that Mary was a part of the church. I think that the, the my comment to all of that would be that we need to realize that there's things that God does that we don't understand, and that the whole thing right. about God is a mystery. And right. it's okay to have a mystery. We can, if we think we can, if we think we can understand God in total, then all of a sudden we're trying to manipulate Him, you know, like a puppet on strings. That doesn't work. Right. Right. Uh, if they say in Texas, that old dog won't hunt. That dog won't hunt. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, we got to be, we always have to be careful. Um, our, our natural religious impulse, right, is to do things so that we get things. Right? Well, yeah, but it's our natural impulse. It's understandable, right? We all have, we all have caught ourselves doing that. Right? So if I'm just good enough, right? If I, if I just do all the things I'm supposed to do, God will bless me. Well, that, that's not really how it works. Our Lutheran friends should know that, right? Is that that's not how it works. <laughs> um, so it's, you just always have to watch that, right? Because it's in you. It's in me, right? Um, I, I'm doing everything right, where is God? Right? Well, God's right there where he always was, and he's bringing his will to pass. Um, and if that's a problem, then the problem is not with God. Right? Um, but it may very well not be what we expected or wanted or even thought was his will. Right? Right? Um, so, so anytime it, we do anything with the expectation of, you know, the magic happening, right? So you, you get something back, you, you, you give to get. Um, then it's contractual. It's no longer relational, right? We're no longer relating to God. We're just, you know, putting our quarter in the slot, hoping the, the gumball will come out, right? And that's not... Uh, uh, that is natural religion, not true religion. Right? Um, that's where we want to go instinctively, but it's not how this works. So. Can I express something? Because, yeah, please. Because I write choir articles, newsletters, mm -hmm. emails, and things like that, and I say a whole lot about saints and good stuff. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify that in terms of the whole people having same powers of God thing, I come from a church where, Eastern Orthodox Church, where we not only believe, but we have physical evidence that people have been given abilities and gifts by God to do miracles. You know, that God has given them abilities to heal through their prayers and things like that. So the church, my church teaches that you never automatically ascribe the powers of God to a saint, but if a saint died with abilities that God had given him or her, right. then they still got that when they go to heaven. Right. Yes. So, yes. So that, so, but I wanted to clarify it <laughs> yeah. because sometimes it may seem to my, um, my darling Episcopalian choir 
<laughs> that I'm just really pushing the envelope of the saints. But what I'm trying to express is that God can give those kind of gifts to any one of us. You know, there, there are people here in this parish who probably can pray over somebody and they get healed. We just don't know about it. You know, and you know. Uh, we, we often have this conversation in my office. She'll come in and say, so, Father, is this what I want to do? Is this OK? <laughs> I, I always check with her to make sure and I'm I'll, not going against Episcopalian theology. And I'll say, <laughs> wait, 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 explain that again. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I emphasize the things that we share as a church and not right. as a, things that we don't. As a good uh, Reformed Catholic, that is a Protestant, um, I, would, I, I would say, I don't disagree with anything you just said, I would probably say it a different way, which is that God works through mm-hmm. those people mm-hmm. with his power. He doesn't give them the power, right? But that is, is that hair splitting? Maybe. Right. It's important so. to acknowledge that it's God's power because, right. you know, St. Basil of Ostrog, who's actually healed people I know of some deadly things um, through mm-hmm. his prayers, would tell people when it happened, don't emphasize me. God did this. Right. And so every time someone... And that's how, how you can tell, that's how you can tell a real saint. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what they do in the Gospels. Right. They go around here. Right. Like, I can do this God did. Yeah. Right. Yeah, don't, don't worship us. But, right in the book of Acts, like, but no. But you're Hermes. We know you're Hermes. <laughs> As if. Wait, back so. up a minute. <laughs> Watch it. Problem paganism, darling. Well, Williams, I am Hermes. Thank you very much. So anyway, yeah. hey, have we beaten that one to death? Can we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're getting past two today. This is fun. There may be uh, a new, I have one, one comment though about the first question. Yeah, please. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is, since I was here and since Kevin was here, we remember that this was a struggling mission for a long, long time. Uh-huh. And the first rector of the parish actually came here to be the vicar of that mission. Right. And the second and third bishop of Dallas said, we're going to bring you there and I want you to either close that thing down or build it into a church. One of the two, I'm tired of it. Cost money, you know, down right, money. right. So, and he was 28. So he didn't know it could be done. Right. So he got busy and he visited the people and told them to go bring their friends and neighbors and all that sort of thing. And people mm-hmm. actually did it, which mm-hmm. is usually not what happened. <laughs> before, long, before long, in fact, when I got here in April, uh, we were still a mission, but when November came, or October, whatever the month was, uh, we were ready to go down to the diocese with the the ability to pay our bills and do all that sort of thing, which is what it means to be perished. Now, the people that prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that we could make that. We didn't pray that God would make us a parish. We prayed that, you know, that we be given the strength and the wisdom to know what to do to build the place. So, when we finally got there, and we were accepted, and became a parish in union with the Dice of Dallas, then we started thinking, well, let's see, St. John's Church always celebrates on St. John's Day. St. Timothy's does that on St. Timothy's Day. What are we going to do? Holy the Day is Christmas. We do that anyway. So we right. won't be able to have a special day. And uh, um, then Rector said, since we got, we said we came to Paris on the 28th of September, which is one day before, mm-hmm. St. Michael and Lane was E. And mm-hmm. you know, why not just Adopt St. Michael. So, that big bell out front, mm-hmm. if you dig through all the dust and grime, <laughs> if you dig all the way across on that thing, we're dedicated to St. Michael, who it has a name. St. Michael is out there. And I want to just mention that because most people don't know that. Yeah, and this is yeah. a piece of trivia. Yeah, it's fun. That's kind of interesting to know. Yeah. Oh, cool. Absolutely. That helps a lot. <laughs> so, we're continuing in the same vein here. Um, about prayers and and how do we pray and all that. So here's the question. Some prayers end with through Jesus Christ our Lord and some with world without end. Where does world without end come from? And why are we praying, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but why are we praying through Jesus Christ when we can pray directly to God? All right. 
So that's um, that's that's all a good question. So world without end. Um, world without end is is just one way of translating the biblical. Um, uh, to ages of ages, right? Um, the, the Greek word there is uh, I, Ionia, something like that. Um, sometimes I can't remember names either, so there you go. Uh, so the, um, so to ages of ages is simply a phrase that means, right? Forever. Um, yeah, the Latin is in secula seculorum, right? Um, from age to age to age in perpetuity, right? Um, so world without end is that. It's also um, simply an acknowledgement in our prayers that God is eternal, right? I mean, that's important. God is eternal. There is no, I mean, we can look at, the, at the, the progression of salvation history, right? There's a story there and a story arc, right? And so we can talk about the end of the story, right? And we talk about the last things, right? Heaven, hell, judgment, resurrection, all of that. Um, but in, in the sense of God... And what he's like, there is no end, right? Um, and somehow that allows for progression, even though God doesn't change and doesn't end, right? So, so that's partly why we say that in more uh, in more formal prayers. Often, um, <clears throat> now here's the other thing: through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, there, there seems to be a whole Trinitarian tradition, right? I mean, first of all, when you say through Jesus Christ, you, you are praying directly to God, right? I mean, Jesus is God. But there, there seems to be a sort of economy in the Trinity, right, where... And we were just talking about this a minute ago, right? The, where, how, the, how the fathers talk about, you know, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, is the one that manifests to people, right? And therefore, he's the one who is, who is then uh, incarnate, right? This, this kind of makes sense. Um, so, if we think about the three members of the Trinity, the Father um, is simply, you know, God full stop, right? Jesus is God, but he is the one who has taken our flesh upon him and died for our sins, right? Through which we can approach the Father. And then if you think about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that indwells us, right? The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, that then allows us to uh, and helps us to accept what Jesus has done for us, thereby allowing us to, uh, to come into the presence of God. So if you think about that, um, it makes sense then if we're, uh, if we're strictly and completely Trinitarian Christians, right? Which is to say real Christians. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it, sorry. <laughs> um, then it makes sense for us to pray to the whole Trinity in that kind of order. So we pray to the Father through the Son by means of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? My, my, my so, standard prayer ending is yes. the formula I use yeah. to the Father. Through this, yeah, in the the power of the Holy. In the power of the Holy Spirit, right, right. There's another way to translate that sort of idea. Absolutely. So, um, so that's why um, the the short formal ending, right? If you if you want to put a 
You know, if you're, if you're just saying a prayer and you want to put a, a collect the end on it, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? Um, but, it, but a lot of the collects will actually add the Holy Spirit in there too, right? The former collects of the church will add that because it's a Trinitarian prayer. Um, right. Amen. Amen. There you go. It's, it's that whole. That's right. That's a whole Trinitarian uh, formula that comes straight out of the New Testament, um, uh, and it just kind of makes sense. Um, the Trinity. The Trinity shows up in places that we don't always think of. Like just something I'm thinking of right now. Um, the uh, the Curie, right? Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Are you repeating it yourself on the third line? No, you're not repeating yourself. You are play, praying to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, the Father, Christ, Lord, the Holy Spirit. It's a boom, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a Trinitarian thing. Um, so anyway, and there, I'm sure there are other things you could think of that are, are Trinitarian with, without necessarily appearing to be at first blush, right? So. Anything else on that? Yeah. It's in, in the Bible, Jesus mm-hmm. says that no one can come to the Father except through me. Right. So. By me, through me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the, uh, or by way of me. Um, the... Yeah, and St. John, I think it's St. John, says um, uh, in one of his letters, he says, anyone who has the Son has the Father. He who does not have the Son does not have the Father either, right? So, um, you know, how do, we, how do we know? Well, because you confess Christ. So, yeah. It's all, it all goes together. It's, it's, you know, I, I love it. I love being able to say, you know, in teaching or even in preaching, you know, hey guys, it all goes together, right? <laughs> it's like it all fits together. There's not, there's not this part and that part of this thing. It's all one thing. And the only way we can understand it is to pull it apart, mm-hmm. right? But we, you can't just chop up any, any real thing you can't just chop it up to see its component parts and then say, well, that's it, right? The sum is always greater than the parts, right? Um, and we, we forget that these days, right? We have, a, we have a scientific kind of engineering mindset, um, which isn't wrong. It just, it has challenges. It's like any mindset has challenges. Right? And one of the challenges of that one is, you know, we tend to think that if we just chop it up, like a human body, right? If you chop it up into its pieces and you say, well, there, there are all the pieces. That's what they all, you know, do. That's a human being. Well, no. It's just a human body. Right? It's not a human being. Um, if you cut it up, it doesn't work anymore. It's dead now. Exactly. This is a, this is our budding doctor, right? So if you cut it up, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's good that you know that, Lucy. It's so fat. So does somebody else have a question or comment? Well, yes. That was my question. I wrote okay. that question. Yeah, okay, and, good. And part of it, too, uh, I was just trying to glance back, our, was... Why, why are some prayers in with, you know, to, to Jesus Christ our Lord and the Holy Spirit and then others yeah. just amen. <laughs> right, right, sure. <laughs> Does it There's so not like, a, there is isn't a, a rule. Was there a type of prayer that that happens? And were, when it was written, or who wrote the prayer? Yes and yes? <laughs> yes and yes. Um, yes and no, and yes and no. So, uh, <laughs> have I covered all the bases? Um, <laughs> are, are there any options I left out? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there isn't a rule, right? Um, the, uh, 
the, the formal, the more formal prayers of the church, the collects, for example, tend more toward maintaining that, that Trinitarian, right, uh, construction. Right, right, sure. Just the longer form of all of that. Um, but if you, if you notice, like sometimes, all right, we'll, we'll get into the weeds a little bit here. So um, at the end of the prayers of the people, right, there is uh, a, a place for the celebrant to add a concluding collect, right? Well, it's up to me what I want to use. Right? So I use various things. Often, not always, but often I will use um, one of the more formal collects. Sometimes I will use the whole thing. Sometimes I will cut it off at, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? Just cuts. It's not the collect of the day, right? It's just another prayer. Okay? So all that to say, there's not really a rule. Um, so, uh, and, and some people, you know, people as they're writing prayers and writing them down, we, you know, in the 79 Book of Common Prayer, right, um, there are some that I think are probably, um, they're usually not completely new, but they might be a reworking or a reinsertion of something, right? And I think oftentimes they're cut off because, you know, in 1979 we were going for that informal thing, right? Um, but then if you go older, it's an older liturgy, sometimes they're, you know, more cut off just because it's a long prayer, I and mean, why do you want to, you know, why do you want to drag it out even more, right? I'm thinking of some of the, uh, some of the prayers in the burial rite that are, you know, that go on for half a page, and and you're like, okay, amen already, right? <laughs> and th- th- there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've just scandalized people. <laughs> Don't pray over me. <laughs> I thought about something historical that could be added to her question, though. Sure, go ahead. Um, I just thought about something historical that I learned in catechism class. Um, that, um, well, that <laughs> one of the reasons that a lot of the really early prayers of the church, uh, meaning between, say, oh, 325 A.D. and 800, 900 A.D., are so Trinitarian is because they were having so much trouble right. with people who didn't understand the Trinity, who yeah, thought no, they were three different gods, great, and yeah. so so they're just really pounding it, you know, to make sure that everybody understands <clears throat> what the Trinity is. It's like the Nicene Creed. It's like the Nicene Creed. Or maybe God. Or or even or what the very God, very God. <laughs> There's also, <laughs> direct, there's also direct prayers to Jesus by St. John of Damascus and some of the early fathers yeah. and mothers. And they don't say Trinity because they're talking directly to Jesus. So they just say, oh, amen. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly, exactly. But that's a great point, Gabrielle, is that, that there are you know times in the church, the history of the church, when certain points needed to be more strongly made, right? Particularly that one. So. Very God, very God. Right. Right. Yeah. Being of one nature with the Father. <laughs> not Zeus. Well, and particularly not not just the oldest created thing. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's Arius Arian, right there. Is Jesus is the he takes Colossians to its uh, beyond where uh, it was meant to be taken. Right. And he says, you know the. Uh, firstborn of creation, right? Well, see, there, that proves it, right? Jesus is created. He's, you know, he, he, he wasn't, yes, he was incarnate by, by Mary, but, um, but he, he isn't God in the sense that the Father is God. He's just God compared to us, Right? 
Which is wrong. Yes, very wrong. <laughs> You've just very, never heard the gospel wrong. of John? Yeah, well, I, I know. It's, <laughs> you know. Um, so, it, well, once again, we have that, we have that problem of uh, interpreting one passage of Scripture in contradiction to other passages of Scripture, and you can't do that, remember? That's a, um, that's a big no-no. <laughs> already. <laughs> That's a big no-no already. Quit it. Well, I thought of something else. A lot of prayers are written down from the early times because it's monastics trying to teach their flock how to pray. Absolutely. You got a lot of abbots. Well, and that's still how to pray, so they're trying to teach. And and let's be let's be clear here, right? I mean, we use the formal liturgy because it's the best of what we've got. But part of the reason we use that best of what we've got is to teach us to pray. Right? Um, not that you need to have all the flowery language or anything, but you get those patterns in you. Right? Um, and, and you have, you know, in, in those times of stress when you can't pray, right? What do you do? Right? Lord Jesus, stay with us for evening is at hand and the day is past. Right? Um, it's already in there. You don't have to dig anything out. But right? just kind of yell help. <laughs> That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer. But it, there's there's not a whole lot of content to that prayer. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, all of that is fine. Um, but it's nice to be able to say, Lord Jesus, stay with us for evening is at hand and the day is past. Right. Well, you could probably Your say, like, hail. You could say, hail, amen. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm in a <laughs> Here's my prayer. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with any of that, right? But, uh, but prayer, particularly in the Anglican tradition, prayer is what teaches us theology, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we have the articles of religion. We have the Bible. We have our catechism depending on which book you've caught and all of that, right? But uh, it is, you know, the early Anglican reformers took it very seriously that, you know, the whole uh, Benedictine idea of, of uh, ora et labora, right? Prayer and work. And prayer, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, right, is the Latin for it. The law of prayer is the law of belief, or faith, right? So what you pray is what you end up believing, right? So, um, so all of that goes into that whole question of, you know, why do we pray this way? And why do we pray that way? So, um, yeah. Did you ever hear the story about the Russian peasant woman who the priest thought was a theologian? Uh, well, I know that in the East, particularly, the, the title of theologian means something a little different than it does in the West. Um, well, it, so. you know, it does so. But yes, so there's ahead. this Russian peasant woman who was about to be on her deathbed, and mm-hmm. the village priest came to see her, and the way she was talking to him made him think maybe she'd been to theological seminary. Okay. But the thing was, the woman was illiterate. And right. so he said, how do you know all these things? You can't read. She said, well, right. Father, I just listened to the Mass. Right. I just listened to everything I, everything I know. And I just thought that was kind of a cool story. It's a great story. Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. What you pray is what you believe. Right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, you know... There's there's the there's the counterpoint story about the Anglican whose Baptist friend finally got him to read the Bible, right? <laughs> and uh, and 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 he came back and told his Baptist friend, you wouldn't believe how much of the Book of Common Prayer is in here. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know. Which, <laughs> Yeah. Well, we could, we could, you know, we 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 could tell the, you know, 
two Baptists and an Episcopalian walk into a bar jokes all day. But, <laughs> so, um, any other any other follow up on the on the prayer stuff? I, I think we'll stop there. It's a good time, and uh, we got plenty of time today, so we don't have to go over. And we got through, you know, three questions. So. Wow! <laughs> doing it, doing it. We usually only get to two, if that. So, all right, let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for the gift of your church and all of its riches that have been passed down to us through the ages. We ask you to uh, give us your Holy Spirit to teach us all things, to help us to learn from those who have gone before us and to relate to you as you really are. And we ask all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys.